Hello, I'm Glenn W. Hunter, and with me today is Shore Denny, founder and president of Community Now. And this is Shore's three C's of SEL, social emotional learning. Community, communication, collaboration, you know, has a long way to go with regards to um, being um, empathetic in how we communicate with our youth, helping them cope better, and um, promoting anti-bullying as well. I mean, we all do have to get along, particularly in this environment. Today, we're talking about don't bring it back. We can't avoid it. COVID-19 is a part of our conversation. It's part of our youth's conversation. It's part of their life now. And we have to um, explore ways to be constructive as they're moving forward to make, give them the power to be more constructive. So um, we're going to give some family views on what happens upon re-entry. Sure, don't bring it back. Why is that important right here, right now? Oh my gosh, it's important in so many ways, you know, and in so many generations. But right now, don't bring it back is said from every family member in the home to every family member that's leaving the home, right? Don't bring it back. What are you going to do? What precautions are you going to put in place? So I think it's like um, now that we're talking about, you know, the restrictions being lifted, it's definitely time to talk about how to not bring it back. Indeed, indeed. So, you know, I think when we put our children back out into the world, into the street, um, whether it's in a school environment or a social environment, um, and it could go either way, really, in this particular environment as we're trying to figure out what reentry actually looks like. Um, what do you think is the fundamental key for them to be um, prepared to uh, get back into more of a mainstream environment? I would think being informed would be the first thing to, to make sure that you know the rules, you know what's going on, you know um, what area you're in, you know how it's being impacted, that you understand um, and that you communicate that with you know, with your family, that everyone has a, the same basic understanding of the status of the illness and, and mm -hmm. you know, have those conversations of who's going back if, if both our parents are going to go back and then indeed the kids are going to go back. Are we all going back into society at the same time? Is it going to be, you know, uh, you know, staffed like mom goes back to work first? You know, what are those conversations? And and how do we, you know, make sure that we are making these decisions with as much information as possible? So as you're acquiring this information as a parent, um, in order to guide your family in that direction, you know, what are some of the um, inputs that you're going to get? Where are you getting the information so you can make this decision? Oh, my. There are a lot of outlets and we're all listening to different outlets, right? I listen to uh, several outlets. My husband listens to several outlets. My daughter, my niece, you know, we're all living here together. So what we do is we communicate. We sit down and talk about it all together. Wow, did you hear this? Hey, they're saying this. And we kind of bring it together. We listen to the, our governor and we uh, thankfully live in a a state where we believe our governor, we trust our governor, so we listen to our governor and we try to look at what steps and um, what precautions he has for our community so that we can see how we're going to be safe and how we can keep others safe as we're, you know, looking at how we're going to come back uh, into society. I think um, the emphasis on, you know, be safe can't be overemphasized. I mean, you really have to look at it because Frankly, there are severe repercussions if we're being reckless, reckless with who we're around, who we're interacting with. So in terms of being educated and informed, one of the more controversial items that we talk about is physical distancing. What is your understanding of how we should be educating our, our youth specifically to uh, take full advantage of physical distancing and keeping them healthy? You know, part of me is really scared about the fact that we're, our society is finding ways to separate our youth, right? Um, I, I mean, I'm, healing wise, I understand we need to, we need this distancing, personal distancing, but 
it's telling people don't get close, don't touch, don't, you know, don't connect is kind of what it's saying. It's saying, um, it, it's kind of saying, you know, stay over here and don't look, don't, you know, be shun other people, which is really kind of the opposite of what social emotional is. So when, when we're talking social emotional and we're talking about physical distancing, um, when we're talking about trauma, I think it comes down to doing it for their protection, right? We're telling our youth that you're doing this, the social distancing at school um, for their health and their safety. Instead of telling the child you're doing it for Bessie, you're telling the child you're doing it for you, um, you know, to keep you safe. Uh, they've seen a lot of images. They are going out into the streets and seeing the face masks. Um, they're seeing the X's on the floor. You know, they're, they're in the game with us. They understand what's happening. Um, but how do we really, the, the, to me, the question is going to be, how do we do it without dehumanizing? How do we do this mm. uh, personal distancing without losing the human um, connection? Hmm. So, you know, I think an important part of that is the information component. I mean, there literally has to be information transferred uh, from a credible source to uh, again, young people, and in this case, even adults, so that we are in compliance. Um, and, ooh, that word makes me nervous. But that we are in compliance with our overall safety. What mechanism do you think works best? And I'm going to shift from the kids to the adults. What mechanism do you think works best toward the adults so that they receive information that they're comfortable sharing with their kids? I think that you should look at multiple information sources. Um, I don't think that this is a time to be partisan. I think that we should be looking overall at everything and trying to use our critical thinking and, and come up with what we feel is the truth in all of what's going on and, um, and what we feel will protect us mentally and physically, right? So it's, it's gonna be a, a, a mixture, a combination. And it's going to be a combination of interpretations, right? Mm -hmm. um, my husband is getting information and he's interpreting it one way. I'm getting information and interpreting it another. And when we bring that information together, um, we have to not only um, respect each other's ability to critically think, right? That the information that they're bringing into this conversation is valid, is credible, um, that we have to then um, look at all of the information that we've gathered and then compromise and, and discuss it and come up with a way that in our household that we are going to be mentally and physically safe um, using that information. Indeed. You know, as we're talking about information, passing it on, um, there is um, the possibility that information or misinformation reaches the population. And then there are repercussions. One of the challenges of these repercussions are people uh, expiring. Death is a reality of this pandemic. Yes. What, are, <clears throat> what are your thoughts regarding managing death with regards to how we communicate within our communities? Well, we're not really seeing it, right? It's, it's so distant right now that People don't even believe this is happening. So we, we have a pandemic out there that we see through um, our media is killing people that many of us don't really know anyone that has passed from it. Um, the, the numbers are growing. So, you know, more and more people are, right? But, um, and we know that right now that it's ravaging through a senior homes. Um, you know, um, it, it's really harming our elderly. So families that have a lot of elderly members or have those elderly members that are at risk, then, you know, their, their, um, their information is going to be a little different than the information that we're going to get for a family that doesn't have those elders, right? I mean, so I think that the family component means a lot, you know, who, who is in the family and, and what kind of information you need specifically for those family members. 
you know, I think it's important that, as you say, we are communicating with those various family members as we equip ourselves with the fact that friends, family, extended family, in some cases, um, personal family are expiring. Um, but there are some preventive methods that are very popular that are beyond of our vocabulary. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of cleaning regiments in terms of mitigating some of uh, that, that, you know, death component? Well, when we're talking, you know, you've got to first believe that there's a pandemic right you've got to first believe that there's something to protect ourselves from before you can really have that conversation of protection um some people don't believe this is happening again i i say um some people are not wearing their masks they are not taking precautions that a person who believed that there was a deadly uh virus going around would take so how do we how do we bring that information so that that type of a person is going to compromise, right? Compromise with society and wear the mask so that we can all go back into society. So with the, with the fact that there are no funerals, you know, there are very few funerals, our community, our societies are kind of missing the impact of someone passing. Um, there are people that are passing. Some are waiting on those um, services, those funeral services. Some are being done virtually. Some are, so we're missing the impact of physically going to a funeral each time someone passes in our, in our circle, right? Um, and, and it's by distance. So we could see elderly or, or members of our family or friend or circle in, uh, on the East Coast, that we are not ever going to go to that. We weren't going to go to that funeral. You know what I'm saying? So, and, and, and we're distanced again from the people that are being impacted by the virus. So I think that all that we can do is come to a common understanding that something is killing people and we need precautions on how we interact to ensure that we do not harm the people in our circle. And that is why we're saying, don't bring it back. You may go out there, you might think it's time to go out there and to um, reintegrate into the world, but there is still an unknown out there that you can bring back. And when you bring that back, what are the protocols? What are we gonna do when you get into the house? What are, what are you gonna do when you come off of the threshold of the world to your living quarters? And how do you protect the people inside that home? Um, you know, that's where, where we go with the disinfecting. And the, so what is that regimen going to be? What are you going to do at the front, at the door? Are you going to pull your shoes off? Are you going to start spraying with Lysol or um, alcohol and water? Or, you know, what are you going to do? Are you, when you bring the bags in from the store, are you going to stack everything in the garage and spray everything down, you know, and let it dry before you bring it in? What, are, what is your regimen? And, and how does that med regimen improve your mental health? Not hinder it right so how are you doing something to stay healthy to keep your house safe but you are not freaking out doing it you're not going overboard and and making yourself emotionally unwell um living a fear living in fear how do you you know what is that line is i think what people are looking at right now how do i look and feel mentally safe and know that i'm also physically safe Oh. You know, you introduced the idea of fear being played in to part of that regimen, you know, whether it's uh, warm, warm soapy water or, or hand sanitizer uh, or disinfectant, you know, but that fear becomes a driver. What is a healthy way to manage the fear so that there is a sense of functionality in the home? It, it's everything that we've said. It's being informed. It's understanding that um, there is a potential for harm, right? And then taking those precautions. Um, it's trying to broad, uh, go out in increments and broaden your experience, right? Don't just go out into the beach with no, no gear on immediately, right? You're gonna you're gonna start it slowly and, and build your your awareness and your surroundings as you're moving out and seeing. Um, 
I, I think that we should be cautious. We should look and see what's going on around us. Let others go out. Really, I'm going to say, um, not out of fear, but just caution. Um, don't stay in your house with your shutters and looking out. We can we can use things, right? It's not airborne. It's not when you walk out the door, you're going to die or we'd all be dead. We have to start using critical thinking in this. And how are these people getting ill that are getting it? You know, what are the environments that the people that are getting ill, what are they in so that we can do the opposite, right? Or, or, or not that, right? So it's, it's in being aware of, of just um, common sense precautions, critical thinking, common sense precaution, and not do, basing everything off of fear. So as you're talking about, you know, being aware, as you're talking about thinking through it, using some logic, one of the challenges that come up, that comes up is the fact that in the Illinois Empire, we have a lot of families who are multi-generational families. You know, you, you, you have siblings and you have parents and grandparents and maybe an aunt and an uncle thrown in there all under the same roof and you're having different beliefs. How do you use that dynamic as an advantage in terms of communicating a sense of consistency and basically family health? You could have everyone have a job. Big mama, um, you know, one of the elders may be very, very germ conscious. And, and they have the time. They're home. They're retired. Let them clean. Let them feel good. Let them clean. Let them do that part of it for you. Um, when someone feels like they have a job that they can do that's going to keep the family safe, and it's not, you know, um, going overboard, you know, um, I'm not saying when I walk in the door, don't spray me with Lysol, right? That's, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. But, you know, when if, if they let everyone have a job or or be a part of the solution, I think, um, helps. You know, another part of the multi-generational component, you know, beyond the job, which I think is a splendid idea, is um, actually tying that into um, really the health of the individual. Children typically are more resilient to illness than their grandparents. How do you facilitate them coexisting in that same space with not just different energy levels, but different um, sensitivities to the illness that is, um, that, that is around us? The, the, that's where the regimens come in and respect and empathy and understanding and all of that come in for all of them, right? The grandma or the elder needs to have that understanding and respect for the youth to know that there's no way they're just gonna sit somewhere still, right? They're, they are going to move about. So that person has to be prepared in how to protect themselves and protect the family as well as all the others. The kids need to have an understanding that they have a responsibility for the family health and that when they are out there are ways that they can harm the people that they love and that there are things that they can do without again pushing a lot of fear but these are precautions we take right this is just now it's a new normal it's every day when you go out and you're done playing with the with the kids you're going to come in you're going to first wash your hands at the the sink in the garage right or at the you know the first thing that you come into take off your shoes those are your play shoes for outside right you might want them to strip down you know i'm depending on you know the the risk level of the household strip down have some other clothes waiting for them right there a robe to put on they might go straight to the shower um you know there are ways that we can work with our youth and the energy that they have and and again give them a job make them a part of it so it's not penalizing them for being out and living but it's them being a part of the solution of how we do live um, and how we are able to go out but protect each other you know, we're at a point, re-entry is going to happen yes. one way or the other. With our theme, don't bring it back. Sure, I need one thing that will help us get into re-entry healthy. Oh, 
critical thinking. Use your brain. Don't believe everything that you hear. Listen to credible sources and think about what you're hearing. Think about it, put it up against everything that you know, and then do what's best for you and your family. Doing what's best for you and your family really sums up what we're trying to accomplish as a community. Again, Shore Denny of Community Now, founder and president. I'm Glenn W. Hunter, and we are winding up this episode of the three C's of SEL. Keep in mind community, communication, collaboration, that's what's moving our communities and that's what's moving us forward in this region. And uh, sure, I would say that we want our people to be safe. What would you tell them? I'd tell them to be safe, stay well, um, but don't go crazy. Don't go crazy with it. Living in fear is not fun and I don't believe that we need to. I think that this can be done in a very sane and healthy way. So remember, if you have any comments, anything you want to tell us or any topics you want us to talk about, just uh, leave a comment, subscribe, like, and share us. We are always here for you, and we just want to help support our community. So be well. Thank you.